morning to the participants attending from the Americas. I take this opportunity to welcome warmly the group of students and teachers from Universidad Popular Autónoma del Estado de Puebla in Mexico. Hola, bienvenidos. Good, after, good afternoon to those attending from Europe and uh, good evening to friends from Middle East and Asia. I'm uh, Paul Dembinski, the director of the Observatoire de la Finance, a small think tank about ethics and finance in Geneva, and also co-president co of the jury of the Prize Ethics and Trust in Finance for a Sustainable Future. This, this is the third seminar webinar in a series along the road leading to the closing of the eighth edition of the Prize Ethics and Trust in Finance for a Sustainable Future. Indeed, the closing date of submissions is very soon, is uh, by the end of May. It's addressed to people under 35 for a short essay of about 5,000 words that has to be submitted by the 29th of May. So please circulate the information if you can and uh, make the multiplication of entries. We are grateful for our supporters for institutions that support uh, and you have their logo on the, at the bottom of the page. So let me now come back to where we were with our seminar. And uh, today's webinar is organized jointly with UNIAPAC, the International Union of Christian Entrepreneurs, as a loose follow-up of the conversation that we had in Rome in Vatican last October. Finance for sustainability is a dynamic universe, a node of heterogeneous strategies, products, promises, all geared to at using massive financial resources at hand, both private and public, as a lever to foster sustainability broadly understood, encompassing its environmental, social, and governance dimensions. Finance for sustainability combines many walks. From the heritage of what was called since the 30s, socially responsible investment or ethical investment to the more contemporary work of sustainable development goals. So one can say today that finance for sustainability has one overreaching goal to mitigate climate change while significantly contributing to the achievements of sustainable development. Today, we are honored to, have to share the next 90 minutes with five preeminent speakers with direct experience and deep expertise on different components of finance for sustainability. You have seen their short bios on the webpage of the, of the, of the event, of the, of the webinar, but nevertheless, let me remind in a few words in an alphabetical order, the qualifications of each of them. I will start with Bertrand Badre. Thank you for being with us. Uh, welcome. Uh, expert in development issues, former managing director of the World Bank, today managing partner of Impact Venture Capital Fund, Blue Like an Orange. Bertrand is headquartered in Paris, and Paris is in trouble today, as we all possibly all know. Then we, are, we have Roland de Corvée joining us from South Africa, where he is running an industrial venture capital fund active in agri-food industry, Alpha Talents Africa. Roland has 20 years experience in the industrial management in agribusiness sector all around the world. So we have two venture capitalists, the use having different roles, but we have two venture capitalists. Then we have Lucius Hankan, who is director of corporate sustainability at the European Development Bank. Thank you for being with us. The bank is lending and investing massive public resources into economic fabric of European Union with particular attention to sustainability issues. Hakan is, uh, is joining us from Luxembourg. We have also with the pleasure of uh, welcoming Marilo Schaufelberger, who is in charge on implementing responsible vision across asset management portfolio at the PICTE Group in Geneva. So she is based in Geneva as, as uh, we are with Virgil and myself. And finally, we have John Thompson, senior fellow at the, at the Boston Institute for Developing, Developing Economies. John specializes in research and consulting in capacity building of the financial sector. And previously, for many, many years, has, John has been the head of financial affairs division and financial counselor at the OECD in Paris. 
So we have a, a wonderful panel in terms of different roles played in uh, the sector of or the, the domain of sustainability finance for sustainability. We have agreed to divide our the conversation to three more or less equal parts. Each after each round for the participants, there will be possibility to to join for Q Q Q and A's. But you have to submit your questions in writing. Virgil Perret, who is also on the screen, who is managing the prize at the Observatoire, will will run the, the quick Q and A session. So without losing too much time, let's start with the first, first round. And I would invite each of the speakers to take not, not more than five minutes to explain to the audience her or his own positioning and expertise within this universe of uh, sustain, finance for sustainability. And I think it would be interesting to pro provide the kind of personal touch direct experience, uh, uh, direct experience relation and possible interests. I would suggest that we start with bankers. So we have two of them. Let's start with, with Lucius Hanken and then with Marie-Laure, and then we move to venture capitalists and we find and we find end this round with John Thompson, who is going to speak about blended finance. Thank you very much, Paul. It's a pleasure to be here and um, good day to everyone indeed. Let me first start with the spoiler. Will sustainability deliver? My answer is yes. So I'm among the optimists. And why do I believe in that? Because more and more people are really seeing the need. And I'll be a bit personal, as you suggested, Paul. Um, though I work at the European Investment Bank, and I'm very happy to go into details on that. On the personal side, I also teach at, teach at university, and I've been doing that for 15 years. And while it was starting with classic things such as, you know, corporate finance and finance and infrastructure finance, it became very clear that the issue of sustainability, of environmental and social considerations of governance are just not there. So 10 years ago, I went to the universities I was teaching at and I said, please, why don't we do this? And um, it, they said, yes, basically. And since 2014, I'm teaching on sustainable finance. I called it sustainability in finance at the time. And I have seen clearly the change in mindset, especially amongst young people. And that gives me a lot of hope. I'm very positive that we are going to deliver. So while the young people are there and they're on board, also the institutions are changing. And my institution by its very nature and mission is looking into environmental sustainability and believe it or not in its statutes going back to 1958 it actually writes in it that you look into environmental uh, sustainability but further than that at eu level we have got this huge change um politicians regulations parliament are all behind it and i can see this movement all around the world so i'm really positive and i can see that in our work, in my daily work, but around me, things are moving and they're moving in the right direction. My question will always be, are they moving fast enough? So I will leave it at that and then pass on the word. Thank you. We are have the opportunity to come back on the points of teaching at the very last part is very important <laughs> one. It's a very important, I would, I'm eager to know more what you put in your courses, but that's, that's let, let's wait for, for a couple of minutes or tens of minutes. Marilo, what is to you? You are on the asset management part and try to green it to some extent or make the more responsible, implemented, irresponsible vision. You know, one of the largest asset management firms in Geneva and in the world. Thank you, Paul. And uh, I have to say, I, the, the word optimism also resonates very, very strongly with me. I think I, I don't think we would do our roles like on um, respective roles if we weren't uh, undying optimists. Um, also on a personal note and, and why I'm optimistic is, is, is linked to almost my career path, right? Um, I started 15 years ago in the financial industry, always at PICTA, um, and always linked um, in some way, shape or form to sustainability. Um, except at the beginning, I was in a marketing and comms function. I was in a public affairs function, external facing, dealing mostly with the issues that are linked to our own operations, solar panels on the roof, 
were we a responsible corporate citizen, you know, the corporate social responsibility piece. And as my career advanced, I ended up in fund selection and in the, the thematic strategies, which we have a very uh, large um, exposure to. So dealing with water, or clean energy or, or nutrition. And now I run a function that cuts across the entire group and reports directly into the board. And I think this career path is exactly the path that sustainability has taken in the private sector and notably in the financial sector over the last kind of 15 years, which is that it went from being a marketing and communications effort um, to something that is much deeper, much more anchored in strategy and much more linked to investment leadership, right? Um, there is an understanding in financial institutions today, or at least in the leading ones, um, that if you do not understand these challenges, these trends, the fact that we're on a finite planet that our um, make take, you know, our, our make take waste model um, doesn't move to circular, um, that we don't address the underlying social inequalities that underpin the environmental challenges that we have, um, that we are going to miss out on what will it will take to lead in the investment world uh, in the coming decades. And so I find that extremely interesting because we start getting to the core of the problem and why I'm also optimistic that we're dealing with these challenges, probably not fast enough. And, uh, and we'll talk about that, I'm sure, um, in the rest of the seminar, um, maybe leaving you with, with two little bits on, on where I think and where we think um, the role and responsibility of finance is, especially as a mainstream financial institution, as Paul said, investing on global markets, um, dealing with um, different asset classes from listed equity corporates to fixed income to sovereigns to real estate to private equity um, and um, really two roles there right one channeling capital towards the solutions right um, so really channeling them to where we need the, 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 the innovation to take us to a net zero and just as world. And the other side, which is the much bigger part for a mainstream investor and we'll come back on that is the engagement for change, right? 95% of our economy um, needs to transition from brown to green. If we take only the green piece, we can talk about the social piece as well. Um, and so the vast majority of the work of a mainstream investor today is to identify where the transition should and can be accelerated um, and to have the conversations uh, with the companies in which we invest, have an active voting policy, and all of these bits. And so those two factors are really where we can um, help accelerate the change, but we will never be able to do it in the absence of policy reform, in the absence of some form of regulation, in the absence of other actors moving and of the impact actors, which we'll heard, hear more from, I think, in this seminar, given the, the people that we, that we have around the table that are pushing um, and at the fringe and innovating um, at, to, towards what finance should potentially become. And I will end on that. Thank you for put stressing the point that finance has to become real and to land somewhere on the level of enterprise management. So it's a very good transition to our friends from venture capital industry. Bertrand, could you open the fire on the venture capital? What are you doing? What is your experience? What are your takes? And do you share the optimism of the two former speakers about the whole journey and uh, uh, of the sustainable finance for sustainability? Thank, thank you. Just an element of clarification. I'm not in venture. Uh, I'm investing in sustainable development, in, in debt and equity, in emerging okay, and developing. Sorry. Sorry. So I don't thank want you. to. Thank okay. you. Even better. Even better. It's I don't know if it's better. Variety of experience. Uh, variety of experience is even better. Two words on my experience, and then I will say why I don't totally share the optimism of my two, of my two colleagues. Uh, my experience, uh, I, I, I've been. I've explored all uh, areas of finance, uh, from being the managing director of the World Bank to having started my own fund, starting from scratch in a basement in Washington, D.C., uh, to finance, health, education, agriculture in Latin America and then in Africa, which gives me the privilege to speak at the two levels. So I can, I can really engage uh, at the level of the head of the EIB or the World Bank or whatever. And, and President Macron has just asked me to precisely what we are discussing to, to work on how to finance the private sector in the South for the summit is convening in Paris to discuss a new financial deal with the global South. Um, and at the same time, I'm also uh, discussing real, real staff when I'm pitching my fund to not the head of these institutions, but to the real guy making the decision on a day-to-day -day basis. 
And uh, that's where you have a big discrepancy. And that's why I'm not that optimistic. The system, whatever people say, is still very much driven by the traditional risk return analysis, still driven by performance, in particular those days when it's checky. So when everything was okay uh, two years ago, you had so much money in the world and everything was okay and the world after was coming, etc. Everybody was okay. Yes, let's deal with that. It's okay to be sustainable, etc. Now we are back to real life and I think it's way more difficult. So we should not fool ourselves. I mean, it's, it's, I don't want to say that nothing is happening. That's not true. A lot is happening. Uh, and there are a lot of efforts ongoing. But we have by far not passed the point of non-return. And precisely because we are at a decisive moment, because we start to realize that the commitments we made in 2015 on climate in Paris and sustainable development in New York were way more serious than what we thought at that time. It's not a transition. A transition is very nice. I mean, you, you transition from, from one side of the beach to the other, and you don't realize, and you move 1% per day. That was the message. You just reallocate 2% of international savings every year and you're done. And then after 30 years, everything is okay and you don't even feel the pain. No, it's not a transition. Now we are realizing it's a transformation. And then, because it's a transformation, you have two people which are basically uh, opposing themselves. On the one end, you have the Ron DeSantis of this world, you know, the governor of Florida. We had a very, very, very crystal clear tweet two weeks ago, ESG is a threat to the American economy and the individual freedoms that our country is built upon. It is dead on arrival in Florida. That's on the one end. On the other end, you have the NGOs who say it's never enough. And, and so now you're stuck when you try to do something. Okay, you're stuck between these two people. And what's your reaction? I want to hide myself. I just don't want to take any pain from one side or the other. Mm. So because precisely we are hitting the wall, it's becoming really serious. It's no longer talk, talk, talk. It's really making a difference. And, and it's going to be very tough for people to make a real difference. And that's where we will see who is uh, serious and who is not. So I, again, I'm not optimistic or pessimistic. I just say that we've not even started really the journey. The pinch of realism. Thank you. <laughs> Roland, you are speaking from another perspective, both geographically and from let's say the value chain of finance, you are located in a different position. Please share your position and Thanks. your perspective. Thanks, Paul. Maybe just a, a little highlight as well, though um, we talk in finance, I'm probably the least competent finance person here, Ron. I'm a, I'm a basic operator and industrialist. So I transform raw material into finished product and on the way trying to make a little bit of money. Um, now, talking about, I think the, you know, sustainable finance experience over my last 33 years. What I like to share is maybe the four stages I went through, not because my life is interesting, but because I think it can help understanding the learnings and the evolution to the conclusion of what I think is truly sustainable finance economy today. So I was first, in you know, the first phase, I was 24 years in the industrial world. I was a uh, with Nestle, I was the CEO of Nestle in countries like China and Pakistan and Switzerland and so on. And in these industrial worlds, when you talk sustainability, it's really about mostly supply and guaranteeing the supply, the development of farmers. And this is obviously very key because it's a key raw material input for the business, but also, and we somebody talked a little bit about it, is the growing pressure from the customers. The major thing which has changed from today, so when I grew up, is what used to be a niche has become mainstream. I don't think the financial world is there yet, but the consumers want. When you talk about food, you cannot sell a product today in Europe if you don't know exactly where it comes from, how to the traceability, the sustainability, etc. However, in the industrial world, sustainability is really if you make money. And if you can have your key input in place, that's sustainable enough, you know? Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that this is good enough because sustainability is talked about, but is not measured as is not rewarded. And we'll come back in the, in the second question. So we live in a world where you manage an industrial company and then you need to increase the percentage of your profit on a yearly basis and I believe this is not sustainable because, you know, how far up can you go? 
I left Nestle, we were at 15%. Today, they are at 18%. The management want to reach 20%. How far, how enough is enough? And I think that's clearly one of the um, limitation. That was my first 24 years. Then I left completely the business world and joined an NGO. So I went 180 degree and joined uh, as managing director, an NGO, it's a hospital ship, it's called Mercy Ships. It's basically a, a cruise ship flo uh, floating uh, or sailing around Africa and making operations. So that's the other extreme. That's 100% impact, transforming lives on a daily basis. However, 100% finance by donors. So it's a very expensive model. So very impactful, but not sustainable. Then my third phase, I tried to combine these two part of my life. And for six years, I created a company in, in South Africa called Phil Africa, who really wanted to combine the sustainability with the profitability. I found some large Canadian investors. They invested a lot of money. And basically, for several years, we grew agriculture and food processing in Africa. However, that was what I call the end end model. So investors wanted to be, yes, we want to be impactful, but we want as well no compromise on the return. So we have a threshold of 15% IRR. My friend, you don't have your 15% IR. You don't even make it to the investment committee. Okay. And that we did okay, but we never reach these landmarks. Okay. So I believe doing good has a cost, by the way. So the last stage, which is what I'm doing now over the last one year, is really conclusion is to set up, and again, I'm talking industry and I'm talking Africa, which might not be relevant everywhere, but a true impact investment company, which summarizes our vision in terms of we want to optimize the return and maximize impact. So I believe people who tell us we want to maximize return and maximize impact are in the best case scenario incompetent and in the worst case scenario lying. You can, so I believe you need to optimize return. You need to make a positive return. You need to make your money, otherwise you're not sustainable, but you need to optimize. The question is what does optimize mean? Fair enough, and maximize the impact. And for that, in my case, in the case of Africa, you need different time horizons, not a five, 10 years P, but a 20 years horizons. You need more modest return. In our case, seven, nine, 10% IRR and not 20. You need to measure the impact not just financial impact, and you need to reward the impact, not just financially driven. So in summary, when from the corporate, it's all about, you know, sustainable is about profit, to the NGO where the sustainability is about impact, trying to combine both at equal weight, and I finally ended up with basically what I would call true impact investments, and I would hope the students listening to us, they will learn faster than I. It took me 30 years to learn all these things. <laughs> and if we can help people to learn faster, then the better. Thanks. Thank you for helping them to learn faster by sharing your experience. Thank you very much. John, let's, let's turn to the blended finance. Uh, I'm a little unusual in this panel in that... Uh, I do not do sustainable finance or impact investment as my primary uh, line of work. I, as uh, Paul pointed out, for most of my career uh, before, I was in uh, uh, more traditional things like banking and was at the Federal Reserve. I was in a private bank and then for 20 years, I was at the OECD. And uh, as, a, as I left the OECD a few years ago to become a consultant, and most of that has been in conventional uh, fields. I am now doing a specific job uh, in Indonesia, trying to uh, expand the use of uh, blended finance. Uh, the, it exists to a considerable degree, but we're trying to get more institutions involved. And so I'm kind of an outsider moving in now. Uh, I'd just like to make a couple of observations ba based on what I've heard so far. Um, I bring you back to the last one of the, well, not the last, one of the things I did at the OECD was I was the head of the group that uh, worked on 
uh, OECD principles of corporate governance. And at that time, the notion of, um, what would you say, of social uh, investment or the uh, investor activism, it was there, but it was seen as something that was marginal. It was most, uh, most investment was driven by the profit consideration. And the main consideration of whether we had in mind was to allow, uh, make corporations more responsible to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to the desire of their shareholders for competitive returns. Uh, there was a second one that we recognized, but it was seen as marginal. That is what we call the social, what we're all talking about, the social and environmental aspect of it. Now, I can see that in the years since I've left that, the social side of it has gained. And uh, now uh, met, we are now at a position where it's much more established. So I would like to follow up on one thing that was brought up and that there is a certain uh, uh, reaction and somebody cited the governor of Florida, but he could have cited the governor of uh, several other states that have considerations uh, that people who uh, are, are using the the uh, the flag of uh, social responsibility, environmental responsibility in a way that is not in the best interest of uh, their constituents. So it's moved out of the shadow, but just to tra trace its past, it moves out of the shadow, it's in the center, it's gained much more influence than it had, say, 20 years ago when I was um, doing the, the principles, uh, but it now is becoming more, uh, uh, it, it's given rise to a certain amount of challenges. And I would recommend that you consider uh, what the uh, the people who are raising these challenges are saying. I believe that they're serious. Uh, secondly, another thing I've done recently, and uh, still not published, but this is on the Asia Infrastructure Investment Fund. And I see that there is a big concern there of uh, what would you call it, the NGO and, and responsible investor community that they will not have the same control if the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank gains a bigger role in international finance. They will not have as much influence on that institution as they currently do on, say, the World Bank or the Asian Development Bank and others that are or European Investment Bank, all the mainstream institutions. And this is pretty serious because uh, where is the where is the big stock of savings in the world? It is in countries that are uh, uh, probably what we just described as the global south. And I mean, just the biggest number would be in Asia. To some degree, they share the values of uh, that have been expressed so far. To, an, to some degree, they do not. They're skeptical. And uh, I would say that because of the uh, tradition of expertise and skill that Western countries had, they probably the they, the influence that they uh, could exercise over countries of the global south was bigger uh, than their each is the contribution of each to of, to world savings. Uh, now I'd say in the events of the last two years, uh, there's been a challenge to that central role of the uh, of the Western oriented institutions. And I would say that's a second, uh, uh, let's say, uh, fact that's a fact that's going to have to be lived with in the next um, uh, going forward without specifying the time for it. Uh, so uh, just try to put my own observations, which is somebody who comes in and out of this field uh, and uh, to apply that to what I've heard the other speakers who are more active than I am in it. Thank you very much, John. Let's turn to Virgil. I don't know if the chat has generated uh, the Q and A, uh, some Q and A's that you can uh, share with the panel, jo Virgil. Uh, thank you, Paul. At this stage, there is no question in the in the Q and A, but maybe um, I will ask just a few quick questions to to clarify a few points with uh, with our guest speakers. Um, thank you very much for your your explanations and introductions. Um, Maybe uh, just a question to um, Hakan Lucius. Um, actually, in your work with the with the European Bank of Investments, do you 
do you work mainly with uh, public funds, public, uh, or do you also work with uh, uh, public, uh, private actors, private companies? I, I just wanted to to ask you um, to, to to clarify exactly your uh, your role. Thank you very much. Um, obviously, there are two sides of the balance sheet, right? Where the funds come and where they go to. So on the side where they come from, let me start first. Um, obviously, in our case, these are funds which are raised on capital markets, right? We issue bonds, we're a major bond issuer. We raise them on capital markets based on an equity which was financed by the member states of the European Union. But on the financing side, where it goes to, here you have the full uh, range. Um, you have pretty much one third that goes to the public, you have one third that goes to private companies, and you've got one third that goes to SMEs, typically intermediated through financial institutions, banks, um, also capital funds, venture capital funds, or others. So it's a very balanced mix between public and private indeed. Okay, thank you very much, um, uh, Akan, for this uh, this uh, clarification. Um, um, then maybe uh, also another quick questions to um, to Marie Laure. Um, Marie Laure, do you actually work with um, uh, mainly institutional investors or also uh, private uh, individual individual investors? That's an excellent, excellent question, Virgil, and good to clarify. So the, the PICTE group actually has about 700 billion in, in assets under management and that covers us and custody. And that covers a scope across asset management, which is institutional investors, but also um, what we would call wholesale or retail investors. So people who buy the funds that are created by, asset man by, by our asset management division, but also the traditional business, which is about half of, of it today, which is the um, wealth management business. So there it is more of management for private clients, retail, but, but ultra, you know, high net worth individuals. Um, and that's a really important distinction because the asks are not the same from these two categories, right? On the institutional investment side, what has really grown in the last couple of years, and we don't have one single request for proposal without a mention of this is the ESG risk element, right? How are we as investors managing our environmental and social or governance risk? How is it integrated into our processes? You know, how are we taking into account climate risks, et cetera, et cetera. On the wealth management side, what we're seeing is more of a, a concern about how capital is driving real world outcomes, like to come back to, um, to what, what Pud was also saying, right? And, and there, if you try and sell it, private client, an ESG product that's basically just looking at managing ESG risks and maximizing returns, <laughs> um, they're going to tell you, well, that's not exactly what I'm looking for, notably the next generation of clients that are really trying to look now for these products that are, I, I love this term um, from, uh, from Roland Decove, um, optimizing uh, the return but actually maximizing the impact, which is much more where the goalpost is shifting today for the private client um, segment. So I think, and, and these clients are actually more able to take on uh, liquidity risk, able to lock in um, longer term, uh, longer term uh, time horizons that are necessary to, to have that impact. I would say the institutional investors, the asset owners are an important element of that, but they have their own constraints, which mean that they are not driving nearly enough capital into that space today. Thank you very much, Marilo. This is very um, helpful. Um, maybe one last quick point to, uh, to, to Roland uh, de Corvée. Uh, I was just curious about the size of the, um, the companies you work with uh, in, uh, in Africa in your fourth, uh, fourth stage now in, in Africa. Um, is it um, small, big, or multinational companies, or mainly based in Africa? Or? Yeah, so it's only food processing, food processing, processing local crops, okay. either for the local market or export, and the ticket size is between three to fifteen million dollars. So really SMEs, um, usually be companies. That our first two investments are companies having a turnover of ten to twelve million dollars, and about. 500 to 1,000 people. Um, we also open to Greenfield. By my experience, Greenfield 
in Africa, you just need to go very cautious. So, you know, one at a time, uh, because for every green field, you need a few companies to basically fill the cash flow gap. Uh, but it's basically it's food SMEs in Africa. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Roland. So I think um, for me the, the the everything is clear. So um, <laughs> back to you, Paul. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Virgil. So let's move to the second part, which is the core part, to some extent, and it relates to the question in the title: Will finance for sustainability deliver? Some of the expressions and feelings have been already mentioned in the previous speakers previous round, but we, I would like to come back to it with a more precise way. What, what it is expected to deliver? So what, what are we looking for? Uh, how it is expected to achieve? You mentioned uh, uh, greenfield investment, real economy investment, financial investment, asset management. So what are the triggers for the effects that we expect uh, finance for sustainability to deliver? And there is a question of horizon. It has already been men mentioned by Bertrand and the first remarks that the time is short, finance uh, is biased towards classical finance, finance is biased towards short term. How can we not be trapped with sustainability in what was called the tragedy of the horizons by Mark Carney? Uh, how can we turn financial uh, finance for sustainability into long term instrument? So these are the questions that, of course, you pick, you keep, you pick of, out of those what, what is suitable for you. So let's start with investors now. So let's start uh, with Roland first, then Bertrand, and then with John, and then with bankers, Marie-Laure and Hacken. So let's start with uh, Roland. Thanks, uh, Paul. Maybe let me just start with a, a quick warning. Um, in <laughs> Europe, in Europe, uh, when you know we generally talk about sustainability, most of the time, we actually mean climate, climate change, climate disruptions, you know. Um, and I'm not saying it's wrong, but I'm just saying we often do not talk about social impact. And, you know, it's a very Eurocentric view, which is understandable because with the welfare state in Europe, uh, basically, it's much less of an issue than other parts of the world. However, I believe that social impact is at least as important and especially more urgent and has more short-term consequences than compare with environments. Um, example, uh, migration crisis. Do we actually believe in Europe that giving more money to African countries is going to solve the migration crisis? <laughs> we need uh, solutions. What Africa needs is not more gifts. What Africa needs is not more grants. What Africa needs is more investment. That's the problem. However, when you talk the word investment, immediately comes private equity requirements and not basically to impact. So the social impact is critical. What many countries in development world not putting aside environment, but what it needs is jobs, how to create sustainable jobs. And you know what is actually, I think, urgently needed to make it happen is mostly two things. One is tools to measure the impact outside financial KPIs. So if you don't mind, I'll just share my screen. We um, in Alpha Talents, we came up with um, two things. I believe that when you talk true impact and sustainability, you need to have an impact on everything. So we're saying we have four pillars of value creation. You have individuals, which is your staff. You have communities, which is in our case, our suppliers. You have the environments, and then you have finance. And what we're saying is, when you measure the performance, when you reward the performance of both the investment funds, of the companies we invest in too, you need to be, to, to, to be consequential in the sense that I go to many presentations where impact investors say a lot about saving the planet, helping people. And then usually people get very 
uncomfortable with me when I ask them, I just have one question for you, sir. Here's a pen. Here's a piece of paper. Can you please write down your carried interest formula? Your formula, which calculates your personal bonus. And then the body language changes very quickly because then 90%, he talked 90% about impact, but actually 90% of his performance will be measured on financial return. So what we're saying here in our case is you have four pillars and it's 25, 25, 25, 25. Now, the next question would be, okay, Roland, I like that. That's interesting, but not very original. Everybody, a lot of people say that. How do you calculate it? So this is how we calculate it. And again, caution, this is about, you know, industrial work, food processing in Africa, but I would say conceptually, that's what is interesting. So we're saying, for example, individuals, I worked 30 years for company where incentivize me to have as few people as possible. Why? <laughs> Why? If you want to have impact now, you don't want to have a cold cause Sovietic system, but you want to recruit people. You want to have an equitable salary policy. You want your staff, again, it's very developing world, to have access to medical coverage. And the, so you want to incentivize the management to work on that. Communities, how many of your suppliers do you have? You want more suppliers, not less suppliers. Environment, you know, if you talk to a, just bought a pharmaceutical company, East Congo, and you talk to them about carbon footprint, they look at you and say, what the heck are you talking about? But if you tell him, okay, let's forget about carbon footprint, sounds very sophisticated. Let's focus on waste, okay? We want to measure the waste you are producing. You need, Mr. CEO, to reduce the waste of your company. You need to reduce your water consumptions. You need to increase the sustainable uh, energy and then financials. So basically, that's these four pillars with these specific KPIs, which really force the management to behave differently. And I believe in a sustainable world today, it's a top-down approach. You have investors, you have boards who have a great vision, and you have people on the ground on the operation side who don't understand the language. It's like Chinese and Swiss German, you know, whatever. And then, and then while well, actually you need to have a bottom-up approach, so you need to have these KPIs to be integrated inside the operations so that the operators look at it on a daily basis and then you build up a whatever nice brochure you want to do uh, after uh, the end of the year. So I think that's that's it. And and lastly, I think we live in a Bernard kind of talked about it a little bit, but we live in a bipolar world. Okay, or we have basically two extremes, a bit the same in politics, unfortunately, but in business as well. You've got the what I would call the private equity model which is basically and nothing really wrong. It's partly working, but P model is saying, I want to make as much profit as fast as possible. Okay. Which by definition is not, you know, very sustainable. Um, it, you can make good money for a certain time, but it's not really sustainable. I don't think so. On the other side, extreme, you've got basically philanthropy. So again, Lots of money, lots of goodwill, lots of nice people, but I would say outside medical and education. So talking philanthropy specifically, but business development, it's free money and free money is worthless. Okay. So to be a little bit exhilarating, you've got the big brain with no heart and the big heart with no brain, <laughs> slightly, slightly extreme. And we need something in the middle. We need a third way which again summarize what I believe, optimize return and maximize impact. Thank Thanks. you for sharing your experience and your thinking, which is, as you said, the kind of laboratory approach, starting from the bottom to up to the, to the discourse, uh, more abstract um, about sustainability goals. Bertrand, the floor is yours. Um, if I can piggyback on your last comment, uh, Paul, uh, it's fantastic to have lab laboratories because they prove that things are possible. But we will not change the world by keeping some laboratories uh, in a conservation area. And the big issue is uh, that 
we need to, to share the right level of ambition. And the right level of ambition cannot be different than all finance must be sustainable. All finance must be for sustainability. You cannot not have a big unsustainable finance on the one hand and a nice sustainable one on the other hand, and you feel better because you allocate X percent of your assets in the nice bucket while you do the bad things on the, with the other hand. Uh, and that's one of the ambiguities that we are facing today. We are just part of an allocation. And that, that's it. And, and you feel good. Like when you give money at the collection at the church, you feel better because you've given money. But it doesn't really change your heart to to, pick, to, to follow up on, on Roland's point. You need to connect the, the heart and, and the brain. And, and the, reality, the, the reality is that it's, it's still very much linked to the fact that uh, the system in which we are operating uh, has not changed. Uh, again, uh, taking the risk of being uh, extremely simplistic, let me call it the Milton Friedman system, where the social purpose of business is to increase its profits, meaning that the profit is an end to an end. And the rest does not belong to the economic activity. Friedman does not ignore public interest, but it's somewhere else. It's not part of our business. And that's how we've built our accounting system. That's how we've developed the, 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 the compensation policy, the governance, uh, the fiduciary duties of the people managing the money. Everything is connected to this. And if you don't change that, there is no room for the systems that were long described. There, there might be a room at the margin, but the system itself will not change. And that's precisely the big issue we are facing today. If we don't address the heart of the system, we will please ourselves, we will do great things, because the reality is that the system is neutral. In a way, it doesn't prevent you from doing good things. It doesn't prevent Roland from doing good things. It doesn't prevent me, I hope, from doing good things, but it doesn't really uh, encourage, uh, neither does it punish the bad things. It's pretty neutral. The mm -hmm. point is that if we were capable of, of, of Twisting a little bit the system, we would go in the in the right direction in a in a way faster manner. But it's hard, it's boring, it's difficult. It's about discussing accounting standards, all the discussions around in Europe, AFRAG, uh, or at the international level with Faber and ISSB. This is not fun. I mean, this is very boring and very technical. But that's what we need to do. We need to enter the boardrooms, we need to discuss the governance, we need to discuss all of this. Uh, and we should not satisfy with all our little things that are done uh, here and then. Uh, again, everybody is, is happy to show, yes, look at that, I've done this. But this is not what we need. We need to change all of this, not just a little part of the, of, of the system. And that's where I think, uh, on the one hand, I'm optimistic because we, I know this is what we need to do. And uh, and again, it's it's not easy to do, but at least it's easy to put on a roadmap. Uh, but the reality is that in today's world, there is unfortunately no master of the world like the US where in 1970 when, when Friedman uh, wrote his article. And so you have competing vision. Uh, at the end of the day, if Mr. DeSantis becomes president of the US, I mean, I think we will, we will need to have many round tables like this to discuss. Uh, that, that's not going to happen. Europe alone will not change the world. And on, on top of that, this is my bias because I'm investing in emerging and developing economies. We don't ask them what they need. So we lecture them. We don't provide them support or money and we expect them to, to clap because we Europeans are very good. I think it's, it's, it's more complex than that. So my, my, my point again, uh, I, I think if, uh, sustainable finance can deliver. I, I definitely, and I wouldn't do that job if I did not believe in that. Uh, but, but we need way more laboratories, we need way more pioneers, and we need way more work on the substance, meaning the regulation that really, uh, uh, as I said, I've been, I've been CFO for many years of large banks, etc. You can do whatever you want during two months and 29 days, but on the thirtieth days of the third month, IFRS strikes back. And then you have to apply the rules of the, of the day. If the rules say you have to do that, whatever you think during the uh, two months and, nine, and 29 days before doesn't really matter. And, and my point is that this has not changed. So again, it doesn't prevent us from doing good things, but it comes at a cost. And again, uh, and we discussed that in Rome, well, uh, people can invest in you, but it's, it's, a, it's a pool of assets that can be directed towards what you do is limited because they're not allowed to do that. It's as simple as that. They need to be remunerated for the risk they are taking, and the risk is defined as the famous 15% or whatever. Uh, so if you propose optimization, it doesn't, it's not in the book. It's not in the book. 
And so we can continue. Again, I'm very happy that Roland is doing what he's doing. I'm happy to do what I'm doing. Uh, but if we want to, 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 to really have an impact, it cannot stay at the margins. It's nice and very you know, self glorifying to be at the margins. But this is not what we need. So I'm sorry to be a little blunt. Uh, but I think we, we, we need to, way, to go way beyond. And let me call on, on EIB and others. You need to do 10 times what you do and to make it faster, better, and in a more practical manner. That's really uh, my own experience. Again, I've been at, at, at various positions. We need to work together. Not everybody in his own lane or silos. That's over. And unfortunately, the more I see that, the more people continue to run or swim in their lane. Uh, we not change the world with a, a thousand lanes. We need one big group of people willing to address the systemic failure of the system. And I agree with what has been said. It's not just climate, it's holistic problem. It's environmental and it's social. And we cannot separate the two. Uh, it, it would be so easy to say, oh, let's solve the problem by all having an electric car. I, everybody would love that. Everybody has an electric vehicle and we are done. No, it's not working this way. It's way more complex. And so it, it requires in-depth efforts. Thank you. Thank you. From systemic change and the laboratory conversation, we have to move now to blended finance. To what extent it can be become a mainstream instrument? And you prepared some slides, John, to show the progress of the, this technique. And in the third part, we are going to come back to the teaching, to institutional change in order to bridge the gap between the laboratory and the systemic perspective. Uh, the second is, uh, first of all, I have to admit that there's a uh, mistake here. It's a development finance, uh, uh, social finance below market rates and market investors, but is obviously market rates. And I just copied that and I meant to erase it, but uh, you should fix that one right now. Anyway, uh, what is blended finance? It brings together concessional finance, which is somebody who supplies uh, funding at less than a market rate, and his uh, motivation is not entirely return. And uh, I divide them into two categories, the official sources of finance and the impact or social investors. On the other hand, that is a uh, is a, an institutional investor typically, or it could be a, um, a foundation that has money to invest that it has some concern other than the rate of return. And then we have market investors who, who are primarily driven by the, the rate of return. And the idea is to bring these two together and to construct investment instruments that use both. And one of, and again, this is a point that's come up, so I'll just highlight it right here the social uh, sustainable development goals. So in 2015, the United Nations identified 17 sustainable development goals, SDGs, which they say will end poverty, have prosperity and protect the environment all to be achieved by 2030. That's their target date. I just, uh, so uh, somebody has uh, said, well, environment is not enough, but there is a set of, uh, of uh, what should I say? Of objectives and and, mm -hmm. and benchmarks that can be used, and they're globally uh, accepted. So uh, the the points of reference are there. So the next is, is a typical blended finance, the mechanics and structure. Let me start off. There are four basic products you can have. You can have just an outright grant. You can have a guarantee, which uh, again, self-explanatory, and you can have debt or equity is offered at uh, less than a market rate or to assume, for example, a subordinated position. So going to the example structures on the right, uh, we could have th those that are highlighted in dark are those that are concessional rates. The ones that are in light blue are at market rate. So you could have a, a senior debt or an equity facility that's at a market rate, and the official or the um, the, you know, the official or uh, impact investor comes in and uh, provides first loss capital. Or on the other hand, you can have debt and equity both at market rates, and you have an official guarantee. You could have 
a an operation that's completely at um, market rates, the debt and the equity, but the outside provider gives you a technical assistance that they make sure that uh, the, the people uh, undertaking the project have the capability to do it, but all of the, the strictly speaking financial operations are done at market rates. And finally, a grant, which is some um, something to design the product, to structure it, but uh, it, it's money given uh, to uh, outside of the project structure itself, but to ensure that uh, the, the product that is eventually um, developed is, uh, is, is sound. Uh, let's say uh, covering the, the, these are the, the, by the way, I should say one of the, I'm, I'm not sure if it's mentioned anywhere, but one of the big sources, if not the biggest single source on information um, on blended finance is called Convergence. It's a, um, an organization based in Toronto, Canada, and it uh, is a, a real treasure in terms of data. Uh, both numerical data and analytic uh, work, and that's where the, this information and some of the later data come from. Uh, anyway, the uh, deals are structured or are uh, distributed throughout a, a wide range of, uh, of ag economic activities. You can see them here: agriculture, energy, is more, and financial services are each 25 percent. Um, and uh, they, and again, looking on the right-hand column, you get the average deal size, where energy, unsurprisingly, tends to be the biggest. Health, finance are, uh, are they, the deals are pretty are pretty large. Uh, this is very compact, uh, but this is probably the best way to present the data. Who are the big players in the field? On the left-hand column, you have the development agencies like USAID, um, there's the, the, the Japanese agency, the Australian, the, the German, and the Swiss. You can see their flag down there. These are uh, official development agencies who participate in one way or another, uh, not just giving funds. They could be uh, providing money and for a grant, but it could be technical assistance. It could be expertise. The second major group are multilateral development banks and national development finance institutions. Again, the whole gamut is there. The IFC, African Development Bank, EIB, um, Asian Development Bank, uh, and KFW from Germany. Uh, the next group is private investors, and uh, you see Deutsche Bank, UBS, Citibank, JP Morgan. In addition to their regular uh, operations, they have dedicated units that uh, participate in uh, various forms of uh, blended finance. Uh, and so this would be done on a, uh, on a market basis. They expect a competitive rate of return but they're not, um, it's typically done from a specialized unit. Those that have expertise in the field and finally you have some uh, philanthropic foundations, Rockefeller, Ford, uh, Axion, which is Latin American and agricultural in its orientation and uh, the size. Uh, well, until the onset of the crisis, the, uh, the, the COVID crisis, there had been a steady growth uh, in uh, over the years. $131 billion raised over a almost 15-year period. Uh, that is nowhere near 1% of total development needs as estimated uh, by various development organizations. So. You can look at it and say, uh, well, you've done a great job in raising money, bringing new uh, players into the game, 1,100 investors, uh, almost 4,000 deals, $100 billion, pretty impressive amount. Uh, 
That's a large amount of money, but it still is, let's say, less than 1%. So if you want to scale this up, you're going to have to do more. And then um, to, uh, I'm going to, this, uh, this is from Convergence, and it, the good part of it is that it is, uh, it brings in the last two years where you can see that um, total activity has been falling off since the peak of 2020, and part of that is COVID, but as we all know, there are other disruptions taking place in the global economy, global financial system, so um, we're now in a phase where um, total activity is in, is in decline, it has yet to bottom up. And let me conclude, where does most of this uh, take place? Most of the investment is in lower in, in the lower middle or uh, low income countries are about three fourths. And you look at the map, almost half of this is in Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, uh, very little is done in the former uh, socialist countries, Europe and Central Asia only. Four uh, percent, Latin America. No, the middle income, black, which is say Latin America, South Asia, and uh, East Asia, are modest. But the big amount is in poor to um, middle income to to low income countries, low middle to low income countries. So uh, that's where the activity has been. Well, in a sense, that's logical because this is putting together concessional finance. And market finance and the countries, the poorer they are, the more likely they are to attract conventional finance. I'm uh, sorry, uh, concessional finance. So, uh, well, that uh, concludes my presentation. And uh, at least this part of it, I'll be around to participate in the discussion. But uh, just saying, we've heard people say we have to have more goals than just the environment. Well, the goals are there. We've also heard them say, um, the, um, about bringing together the hard, hard-nosed investors and the soft-hearted philanthropists. Well, the means are there. Uh, it's up to the people who are out there to uh, take it from here. So, stop. I remind the paper by the World Bank, and I think Bertrand played the role of it in it. From billions to trillions is 2007. So we are in the figure. I didn't play exactly a role. There. I wrote it. Yes, you wrote it, but okay. And I should have disappeared. That would process, be very rich. I think it, a very important piece. Marino, as from your asset perspective management, what are the, the the goals you can see as being reachable, and what uh -huh. do you see as those that are not reachable? Thanks, Paul. I think I think taking a step back on the question you asked, right? What, how, and and when? Mm -hmm. And I think the what is so important. When we talk about sustainable finance, we have a tendency to focus a lot on the private finance side of things. And in fact, we need to look at sustainable finance or finance being sustainable across both public and private sector, right? Because uh, public and private finance. Um, to give you an example, right? Because the, the public finance piece is such a huge part of what drives incentives as well in markets, right? If you look at fossil fuel subsidies that represent what, 7% of, of GDP, I think global GDP today, that has an impact, right? The, 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 the energy market is not a free market. Um, and yet investors treat it as such because of the, the, the skewedness that the subsidies put into this, right? Um, same thing with food and ag, right? We have Roland Descartes that works in this, right? The FAO show, had a study that showed that 87% of subsidies that are given <laughs> to agriculture are either market distorting or actively destroying the environment, right? So we have a public finance challenge, right? And a need to integrate as well within public finance ESG factors and, and within public you know, procurement policies. Um, ESG criteria. On the public uh, finance side, if I, on the private finance side, coming back to what, to what we do, I think what's really key in the how is looking at this across asset classes, right? I think several people mentioned um, the fact that this tends to be niche, right? It's a tiny portion of asset allocation. There's a team working on impact or on philanthropy on grants or blended, but we need to look um, as, as investors at the full um, spectrum of assets that we cover. Uh, for us, for example, it goes from corporates all the way through to sovereigns, to real estate, to, um, to, to private equity, and, and look 
at how the capital that we're driving to the companies with or the or the the, or the, the the types of instruments <laughs> that we're using is having what are the outcomes that this is having right and for too long we've i think we as the financial use the royal we right the financial industry we've looked at the risk view when we talked about these issues but we've very we've looked at the efforts right someone mentioned this like what looking at showing it all the efforts that we're doing and we need to move that effort discussion to an outcome discussion and that we can do by looking at you know what impact um the companies in which we invest have because it's not our impact it's actually the impact the companies in which we invest have and how we can actually accelerate a transition when it needs to happen um, and i think uh, yes we don't we shouldn't have an over focus on climate but i i must say that the fact that there is the paris agreement and that there is a global policy framework um, with a direction right well below two degrees that articulates that vision that's signed by different countries has then trickled down into policy, which has also trickled down into regulation, most notably in Europe, around sustainable finance. And the advantage of this is that because it's inevitably going to trickle down in regulation, the private sector has gotten organized. Right, we have this GFANS, <laughs> the Net Zero Asset Manager Initiative, Net Zero Banking Initiative, Net Zero Invest uh, Insurance Initiative, etc. And they've done that because they also want this is incentive right to to show that they're doing things so that there's not too much regulation the regulation will come it has to and it is already coming in in europe but what this has done is it's forced a framework and so if you take a company like peak Ten, we have now um, a net zero commitment we have uh, science-based targets that have been validated which actually commit us to engaging with the companies in which we invest to set their own science-based targets so to actively reduce emissions. What it's also done beyond what we can do on the engagement side or driving capital to solutions is that it forces the conversation around, okay, the climate change question is one thing, but when you dig, you realize that it's also about, it's not just about decarbonizing the economy, it's about the sinks that we've destroyed and continue to destroy, and that we will we will inevitably have to destroy more as we move from a fossil economy to a mineral-based economy, right? Solar panels, wind turbines, the electric vehicles, Beth Hall mentioned, all require massive amounts of mining. That mining will have to take place on a scale we've never imagined, right? <laughs> if we have to transition our economies. Where are those mines going ha to have to open? We're gonna have to open if we want to reach the target of the renewables that we've set. These mines are sitting in the global south underneath the carbon sinks we need to protect. So all of this also has geopolitical ramifications. It has ramifications with what kinds of contracts and, and, and new financial deals we'll have to set um, and, and the kind of thinking we have to do. And as investors, we have to now figure this out. And therefore you inevitably get to the social side of things, which we have not talked about yet because human beings do not destroy nature or pour carbon into the atmosphere for fun. We do it because it's a livelihood question and we need to decouple that livelihood and that well-being question from the destruction of our natural world. And so that is a deeply social question. It's an equity question. And we're now, thanks to this global framework, coming to these discussions, which we absolutely need to have. And the when, Paul, <laughs> I think <laughs> it, will, it will accelerate and it will come when we throw all of our energy as well into looking at incentives and the governance of long-term value creation. And I use the term value creation because it's not about financial value creation, it's about environmental and social and financial value creation. Um, incentives drive behavior. Everything else is commentary, right? This is uh, an economist, I can't remember which one said that, but it's so true, right? And as long as our incentives are the 90% financial returns and that's what we value and that's what we pay for, we are not going to solve this fast enough. And so I think we need to do much, much more work on what are the incentives of long-term value creation? What is the governance around this? What are the outcomes we're looking for as a society, as a global society? Um, and and how, do we, how do we then create the incentives to drive those outcomes? And I don't think we're talking enough about that. And that is a conversation we need to have across different sectors and public and private, um, breaking silos and, and, and agreeing on that common vision. And until we have that, 
the when is going to be aléatoire. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Mariela. The bridging the public and the and the the, the private, bridging also the finance with the industrial world and the uh, shareholder engagement, which is very important. I think that to which we'll come in the later part. Hakan, please. Thank you, Paul. Um, I, I listened very carefully to what my colleague said, and, and I agree, and I will uphold my optimism. I, I did very clearly hear uh, Roland, and I fully agree with him. You, it's a measurement issue, and you have to measure the impact. You have to know what your effects are. Otherwise, if you don't value it, if you don't measure it, no management without measurement. And I heard Marie-Laure very clearly, I mean, yes, 95% of our economy is probably not circular, not sustainable. The incentives are 90% or even more financial. And yes, Bertrand did say it's a transition challenge. And Milton Friedman was quoted, and also that uh, the European Union will not save the world. But I will add to it, if the European Union doesn't do it, who will? And somebody has to start. And the more we go forward, the more pressing things will become. And even the latest politician at some stage will jump on the bandwagon. There always are leaders and laggards, but it's clear the direction we're going into is unsustainable and we need to change it. And now I'm linking back to the no management without measurement part, because it's true, of course, that our whole problem is that we are set up in a market economy and our challenges are the things which are not captured by the market. They're external to the market. The, the economists would say they're externalities and we're not measuring those externalities. We're not internalizing their, those externalities. So we have to start with a framework of measuring them. And these externalities are not only climate, they, they are biodiversity, they are circularity, they are pollution, air pollution, water pollution, it's social, it's social on all levels of stakeholders, be it your own employees, be it your clients, be it your neighbors, affected stakeholders, your governor. And all those externalities need to be captured. And it's a huge challenge to do it. And that's why I'm so excited that in the European Union, we are having the European sustainability reporting standards being developed. And we do have the corporate responsibility reporting directive, which has come into force two months ago. And the sustainability reporting standards are under legislative process to come into effect, well, not, not too long in the future. I mean, it's 22 months, it's January 25. And then they will touch upon everyone as we go along. There's a staggered process. Yeah, you have to be realistic. Not everyone can do it immediately. Yeah? First, the stock quoted companies and the large companies, and eventually the SMEs over the years. And that establishes for you the measurement framework. Mm. You can't manage without measuring. But once you have the measurement framework, you can do it. Think about the parallel of the financial world. All these systems of incentives, et cetera, you can't have if you don't have financial accounting. Financial accounting, we took 400 years to get where we are and it's still not perfect. Yeah, I can have the same company with two different profit numbers. We all know that. We do not have the same time for the sustainability reporting. And what I see at the European Union level and what my colleagues at the commission do, I find extremely courageous and fantastic that the parliament is enacting it, that the council is approving it, and that this is turning into legislation and going from voluntary to obligatory, establishing a framework of measurement. No matter how imperfect it will be at the beginning, there will be mistakes. Nobody says it will be perfect, but there will be one. It will be comparable. It will be the same for everyone. It will be obligatory. You will have the numbers. And then you can work on that and build your systems on that to internalize your externalities and take those steps, which we have all described right now that are missing. So we are working on that. And yes, the EU is leading the world on this. There's no reason for other one not to do it. Please, everyone can do it. And I'm sure they will. And you can really see, I mean, Australia has jumped on the European Union sustainable finance platform just a few months ago. That the is momentum is there. So I do see it very positively. Um, 
my question, as I put it at the beginning, is will we be fast enough, right? That's the big question, but I'm confident we will get there. Thank you for this note of optimism about scaling, scaling up from laboratory to systemic transformation. Virgil, do you have some questions? Thank you, Paul. Yes, uh, there, are, there are a few questions. I will um, start with uh, one question to, um, to Roland de Corvet. Um, a good indicator of sustainable finance of the poor is when they receive a just salary from public or private companies. How could this be put into practice in Africa? Yeah, very good question. So I would make a difference between sustainable salary and sustainable income, meaning that you, when you're an industrial company, you know you have a res not only a responsibility to pay people a decent wage in your factory, which honestly, unless you are really a shark without any heart, is not very difficult because you know, jobs and salaries have to require minimum of education. So I think you can be at least towards a minimum of you know two worst case scenario of something like two three hundred euros which obviously in european standard is nothing but compared with the average in some african countries is decent but i think it goes much further than that it goes on the supply side you know and this is why i believe this is too much left to the goodwill or the good heart of a, a general manager uh, or even a company it has to be officialized, it has to be institutionalized. So you saw our KPIs. If you're the CEO of a company, and I'm telling you, well, uh, your financial performance will be just as important as the social impact you're gonna have on your supply community, so, or on you, the number of employees you're having. So when you come to a decision, at least they decide on mechanization. You know, if you mechanize, a lot, you're gonna save I fire a lot of people and potentially have a better return. But if I make you, you the two KPIs at the same level, you're gonna think twice between over mechanize and and you know between the cold code system where you have only people who do nothing and no no mechanizations and uh, hyper mechanizations where you're gonna have nobody else in the factory by robot. So this is why it, we have to go back to a system. And you know, uh, since we talk Friedman, I'll talk Karl Marx and um, Adam Smith. You know, we need the labor to be rewarded as much as the capital, okay? And without making any politics, you need to basically have this model where you reward not just based on finance, but also on other criteria. And this has to be embedded and that will automatically, willingly or unwillingly, force the management to take the right decision. Thank you very much, Roland. Um, there's another question to, uh, to John Thompson. Um, in the blended finance concept, how do you deal with optimizing return? Um, what do investors expect from the deals? I mean, how, yeah, how do you optimize returns in the blended finance concept? Well, um, the, 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 that, that's the whole nature of blended finance is that there's one set of actors that enter the deal with non-financial concerns uh, predominant, and they would be the uh, uh, international development institutions, uh, the uh, national development institutions, and some uh, impact investors, as well as charitably oriented institutions so that you bring those together with in, uh, investors who are primarily concerned with return so that is the the idea is that you're the, the whole concept is that you are trying to use a limited amount of resources from the first set of actors who are mostly driven by social uh, ecological those those 17 globally accepted goals and they're trying to achieve them and they're trying to get um, the financially oriented investors to put their uh, their funds to work so that's uh, the, the let's say a, a good measure of how successful you would be is the amount of private 
finance that you can mobilize with a given um, amount of public resources put in. If you were only to get 50 cents for each dollar that you would put in, you would say that's not a great deal um, for the taxpayers and the people who are putting the money up. If you were to have a, a much higher leverage ratio, then you'd be uh, successful. So uh, you'd be much more successful. So if that's the whole concept, is to bring two categories of invest players, investors with two different uh, yeah. uh, motivations together. Now, uh, the, the, they can't be completely oblivious to each other, but that's the whole notion. Thank you, John. Uh, do I have time for our last one? And maybe I'll, I'll pick maybe, the last one. Maybe, maybe, maybe the very short one then. Okay, no, it's a question that has you have already, most of you have uh, dealt with partially. It's a question of regulation. If you had to pick maybe one, because you all agree, I think that there, there is a need for structural uh, incentives, which element would be most important? This is a question, it's open to, to anyone, to everyone. De facto, it's an excellent introduction to this third part. We are going to borrow 10 minutes from the audience in order to finish it. But it's exactly the point, how to scale up and what is the role of public sector. So please maybe use the, the time to answer this question, thinking about the third part, which has already started. So in which order? John, do you want to start? That was my idea to have uh, every every time somebody from, uh, from the blended finance, banking or venture capital starting the conversation. John, do you want to answer? What okay, should, well, yeah. What should be, it, 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 the most important trigger. Okay, well, in my, uh, since that's the way I just ended in my presentation, that's a good way to begin the next uh, session. Um, just say, in, look, staying inside of blended finance would be uh, a need for greater transparency is because uh, deals are not centralized. You don't, you don't have a sense of what a good rate of return is. You don't know what other, people are doing uh, if you have better exchanges of information. I mean, no banker would, uh, they, everybody knows what other bankers are offering, what the risk premiums are. So that's a world where information flows are much better. Here, uh, they tend to be more segmented. And I would, if you would ask me, uh, the, the biggest single thing you used to have is uh, better information about uh, what the other players are doing, uh, and uh, what you would consider. To, uh, uh, are you? Do, are you? Do you have a lot of uh, participants who are not contributing enough? So we try to. Uh, I'd, I'd say better measurement of of leverage that the amount of private funds that are uh, leveraged by, that are made available by it, the. Um, by a given. Thank you very much, John. Hakan, what would you say? What what to trigger? You already entered this sphere in your previous intervention. What uh, what would make sustainable finance a systemic transformation issue? Um, in, in two words, integrating externalities. <laughs> <laughs> But then, the, of course, the next question will be how to teach it. But that, that's for the very end. Absolutely. Marino, Absolutely. What would you, what, where do you see the trigger? Yeah, I can stole my, uh, my thunder. <laughs> I, I had written in big letters, integrating externalities. Because if you do that, <laughs> no, but if you do that, then you align also the whole price mechanism, the incentives, et cetera. And I think one other piece that we need to really think about, and this is more a societal question, is you know, we need to think about what we're paying people to do. And, uh, and if 90% of what we're paying people to do is make financial returns, we're always going to get the same outcome, no matter how many pretty presentations we have. And if we start to value other things like environmental and social outcomes, um, we will probably start getting and, and not value it as like 7% of a balanced scorecard, <laughs> um, but value it at 50%, we start to get, we will start to get um, a very different level of innovation in this space and, uh, and different outcomes probably in the real economy. So turning to, to Bertrand, you said many times accounting rules, reporting rules, incentive systems. So it cannot happen. <coughs> I think it, it, it's exactly, sorry, it's exactly aligned with what Akan and Milo have said. 
it's it's really uh, opposing what some investors tell me, which says uh, I want your financial returns and you give me the impact for free. Everything we discussed has zero value, and in our system, something which has zero value doesn't matter. So we have to find ways to reincorporate everything in the system. Uh, as I said, as a, uh, of course, not, not, it's not so much accounting, it's valuing. It's a different, it's yeah. a different angle. Yeah. I put a value on all this. Uh, and the reality, again, back to my uh, initial point, is that all this has zero value into this system. Zero value. It doesn't mean that people are not ready to do it, but it's, it's kind of uh, for free. Give it for free. It's okay. I'm, I'm very happy to do that because I feel good. But it's this is not the way you will change the world. Bertrand, sorry, Roland. Yeah, no, <laughs> like Bertrand's point. Um, I, I just thought about it. I have three quick ones. I think one is to me for the financial industry to develop tools and instruments which can answer this need. I think, um, allow me to be a little bit critical, you know, I think over the last few decades, the financial industry has been very creative in making very new tools and instruments and whatever. So I think it needs to be a little bit more creative and using a bit more marketing and communications. Uh, you know, in, uh, in a few family offices, which will remain nameless, but with marie Lor certainly know in Geneva, I've been witnessing, for example, conflict of generations, the older generations wanting to as much profit as possible and give part of it to charity. And the younger generation is much more about rethinking the way we invest. So I think we need to, the financial industry need to come up with, with some um, new creative instruments and ways in working with people like uh, Bertrand and us to, to develop that. On the same side on the financial industry, DFIs. So, you know, what we're talking about, the DFIs are supposed to be the solution to that, except that most DFI have forgotten what D stands for, which, by the way, stands supposed to be standing for development, while actually most DFIs are basically disguised private equity. So here again, financial industry. Second is standards. Now, we talked about standards and the EU and how can develop, and we all know what's coming, which is great. However... Being a marketing man, I believe so again in marketing standards. Now, I come from a country where Swiss made means something. Now, why, why are we not capable or, or willing to set up a, I don't know, a, a SSS, a Swiss sustainable standard, or even better, a Geneva sustainable standard, you know? And then you have some kind of a seal of guarantee. You have fair trade for the food. You would have, you know, Geneva sustainable standard while having every year, you know, nice meetings with building bridges, which is great, but what's what's the outcome of it, you know? Um, and lastly, I would say education. So I really appreciate such kind of forum. And this is why I always encourage my peers to spend as much time as we can. I'm never, ever reject an invitation because up to us people who have a few years behind us to really be able to talk, educate, share, uh, and, 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 and and really exchange with, with younger generations. Last point, I would say where I'm still positive, despite the challenges, is I think we live in a society, at least as far as Europe is concerned, where, but I would say overall, so where people more and more want to work with companies with a purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the priorities of the youth and, and not so youth as well, um, you know, when I left Nestle for, you know, NGO, unpaid NGO job, I went to the board of directors. Out of seven people I talked to, five told me, you're doing what I always dreamt of doing, but never dared do it. So I think there's a lot of people out there. The times are changing, and I still believe time is on our side. But like Hakan said, the question is how fast. Thank you very much. The very last question, we have five minutes left. What to teach? To, sorry. I'm afraid I, I really have to go, uh, Paul. So sorry for this. Uh, thank you very much, Bertrand, for having been with us. And uh, we hope for another conversation very soon. Thank you very much, Bertrand. Thank you. All the best thank to everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. So just a uh, few, few thoughts about what to teach, because we are concerned with the young generation. Many, many of the speakers, Roland, at the very end, mentioned the change of uh, sensitivity across generation 
how to feed and how to entertain, how to develop this change uh, of emotions into real knowledge, what to teach. Hakan, you said that you have a long time experience. What do you teach? Thank you, Paul. I think teaching is, is absolutely paramount and I'm very happy to see the, the shift here. When I first started this exactly 10 years ago and I said this was a bit of an innovation, now I'm very happy to say that in one of the universities where I teach in Sciences Po in, in France, climate is now becoming an obligatory class for all students. I think this is a fantastic move. And we really have to get this out, uh, not only on climate, but on the entire question as we have seen it today, and hopefully also into schools. Uh, I mean, as the bank on our voluntary hub, we are starting to take our own experts to schools to teach and to explain what we already know. And I can only hope that this gets more and more acknowledged, comes into the curricula, at universities, but also at schools. Young people are dying for it. They do want to know. Some of them are worried. That's not good. They should not be worried. They should be informed. and They should take informed actions because we all are capable of making a change. We all are consumers. We all are voters, hopefully living in countries where we can vote. We all are in one way or the other decision makers. And therefore we should be able to make informed changes. And I do see this shift into schools and universities and then I can only encourage it to teach the basics of sustainability across the board, not only climate, but you know, all of E, all of S and all of T. So you see a way out of risk, uh, risk return paradigm, yes? Yeah, it, it, it's... It's more than risk and return, right? Yes, at some no, stage, <laughs> at some stage, you um, you only have a finite planet, right? So effectively, you, you need to preserve it. We need new textbooks. Yes, John, what would you add to this? Well, again, I add what I started with. Um, I, I see most of this as a conversation inside of a uh, of, of one group was uh, what would I say with values that they all accept and I said uh, I put forth to you that there are people inside of uh, uh, our own western countries and even more so on the outside that have to be persuaded of various uh, uh, aspects of, uh, of, of uh, that what you we you are proposing to do is actually in their interest and I think there's skepticism both within our own countries and yeah. um, without. I said, so that would be I don't know, education, but it's more um, recognizing that we're talking inside of a, a limited circle and you've got to talk to some people on the outside. Thank you, Marino. After 15 years having left university, what did you change to the programs you have been through? I think we need to mainstream, just like investors need to mainstream ESG throughout their investments, we actually need to mainstream this much earlier throughout every single thing that we teach. Basic understanding of the planetary boundaries, the social, social foundations, I think we there, we, we kind of all agree. If it's not taught in the mainstream curriculum, it's not taught. So a very good example of this, my personal pet peeve, CFA, I did a CFA a couple of years ago. CFA, uh, ESG is kind of tucked into an ethics corner of things, but not really. Um, you know, I think it's evolving over time. They've set up a separate segment that is a CFA ESG. This is not the way to go for me, right? This is something where you need to integrate it into the mainstream curriculum or people aren't going to see it. Second piece, and I think this is often overlooked, is the growth mindset that is necessary to confront the complexity and the uncertainty that we are with, with a, a bit of hope, right? <laughs> I think, um, and I think we need more hope. And so that means that in, we need to also instill in people's minds, an open mind, right? A, an openness to the challenges and to changing things and to changing things that are difficult to change, right? And not be in the business as usual mindset. And that is more than just facts and figures about the, the challenges that we face. <laughs> it's, it's really about, about teaching people to apprehend change 
and uncertainty and to grow. And, and that's management education, but it's also something you can start at school. <laughs> very, very young. Um, how do you teach mediation? How do you teach cooperation, collaboration, communication? Um, and without that, we, I think it's very challenging to face these problems, right? Because people are closed in their silos and they don't question their modus operandi. So I think those are, are two, two pieces that I would look at. So we have to build a group in order to write a new textbook about how to embed finance in the planet. Huh? <laughs> and I think it, it could be a project because uh, from the skeptical perspective to a more optimistic one, providing a huge experience, I think that really it's a project that we could uh, consider carrying out with a group a little bit more extended than the panel, but not very, very much larger than 10 or 10 or 12 people. I don't know. I will be maybe contacting you on this subject later on. I think on. it's a very good project, Paul. So we should we should generate some expertise from laboratory to systemic change and try to do something in uh, which which can be used by others because not everyone can, is able to invest from the teacher's perspective a lot, lot of energy in writing and providing a proper course they need mm -hmm. some kind of preparatory material so maybe we can think about so but but the time is running so i have to close the our time is over so i would like to express uh, warmest thanks to your to the speakers you found a way to communicate what is very important in terms of uh, finance for sustainability what are the limits but also you were able to share some elements of optimism and energy so i think i'm very thank thankful <coughs> to you for this i would like also to thank the small staff of the observatoire hannah soisson and virgil virgil you have seen him on the screen hannah who have not you have not seen but because you have not seen her we are able to connect for the two last two hours so thank you very much hannah two short info before clo clo closing so the recording of this webinar, if you agree, will be online next week, somewhere next week. So I don't see, I don't think you have many reservation about it. But if if you have any, please send us a line. Uh, second, the next webinar of the series, preparing for the closing of the Ethics and Trust in Finance Global Prize, will be on the twenty fourth of March at the, at the two p.m. Central European time. It will be devoted to after. FTX collapse, can crypto assets be still be ethical? You will shortly, all the audience will shortly get the registration links. And the last point is the reminder that for those of us who are happy enough to be under 35, there is a possibility to joining the prize. So uh, please find information at the website of the Observatoire and the proper website of the prize. So many thanks to all of you. Take care and uh, have a nice end of the day or day for John, starting day. Thank you very much for having been with us. And I think it, we had a very, very nice conversation. And I will really come back with this idea of a joint volume or textbook or something like this about how to embed finance in the planet. Planet with people, not planet only with climate. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. So I will thank you. now the session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.